sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Bogard's Bad Day by Robert Walton Ilsa thumped Bogard sharply between his shoulder blades. The blow was much mitigated by the tattered bearskin he wore across his shoulders. She hissed, He's been gone since yesterday noon. Who knows what's happened to him by now? Bogart glanced back at his wife and raised a lazy right eyebrow. Don't you look at me like that. Carl is a respectable man, unlike others I could mention. He wouldn't let a wench or a flagon of mead keep him from completing a job. I sent him to collect the low town rents. He didn't come back. You go and find him now. Bogard grumbled deep in his chest, but no discernible words reached his lips. Ilsa snarled. Besides, he's your friend. Go! <sighs> Bogard opened his door upon a frosty Nordheim morning. Far too early, far too frosty. He stepped out. The door slammed emphatically behind him. He grumbled to himself again and squinted his eyes against the low, bright sunshine. Nordheim's squalid, chaotic streets and alleys lay below him. Steam rose from unlikely places. Smokes, pressed down by the frigid air, hid in hollows and dips. Icicles glinted in the early sun like pristine, diamond daggers. Bogard surveyed all as he pondered how to get news of Carl. Sigrid, the crazed witch, lived in Lowtown and knew all its dark magical happenings. Bogard chuckled. Her nightly habit of sailing the future's deep-misted seas via drug-induced trance would keep her warty cheek upon her warty pillow for some hours to come. She would be his last resort. Gimp, the legless beggar king, would know of all the tavern happenings— he prowled the icy alleys on horny knuckles, propelled by arms thicker than most men's thighs. He took his tolls and ruled his luckless charges with fists much harder than iron. Bogard patted his purse. Only silver produced fruitful words from Gimp. Latifa, the displaced belly dancer, might have news of Carl. Hightown and low, she knew the secrets of Nordheim, as did few others— and she had a liking for the little man. As wide as Bogard and nearly as tall, she dwarfed the wiry Carl. Still, in her heart of a thousand chambers, one of the inner ones was surely reserved for him. Her information, had she any, would be true. Bogard nodded. He would begin with Latifa. Bogard sighed and checked his weapons. He pulled his long axe from its loop on the right-hand side of his three-inch-wide belt. He patted his short axe in its loop on the left-hand side. Both boot knives, the throwing dagger, and the long, heavy, close fighting weapon were ready in their sheaths. These were his workaday town weapons. For true battle, he also carried his war spear, a mace, a sling, and lead shot— he hefted the long axe and paused. Vague unease slowed his momentum. He had no doubt that Latifa's facts were true. Somewhere in the gray dungeons below this wizard's tower, Carl awaited rescue. Bogard cursed. Wizards! Give me twenty screaming Mongol barbarians or thirty blue-painted Celts! Ah. Nordheim had its fair share of wizards, but they usually kept to themselves. Bogard knew nothing of this wizard, one Hunaman by name, except that he was middling high on their list of seniority. Further, he could imagine no possible cause for Hunaman's apparent interest in Carl. <sighs> what must be done, must be done. He rested the head of his axe on the ground. He took a deep breath and gripped its oaken haft with both hands. His shoulder muscles bunched as he swung the heavy blade with all of his might. The pike head of the axe whistled down and blasted into the triple-heavy brass lock on the wizard's door. The lock disintegrated into three large fragments and numerous flying splinters. Bogard pushed open the door with his booted toe. 
Two gatekeepers, still fumbling with their armor fastenings and carrying their short swords like bread knives, stumbled to a halt just before him. Bogard pointed a finger at them. He's not paying you enough, boys. Drop your swords and I'll let you pass. The taller guard replied, Turn around, fat man. Leave. Master will bill you for the lock tomorrow. Bogard's weapon snaked out and punched the smaller guard squarely in the jaw with the blunt of its head. The man fell like a stone. Bogard nodded to the unconscious man. You'll have a headache later. I may have to do something more permanent to you unless you drop that sword. The tall man's eyes widened and he swallowed hard. He took a step back. Bogard stepped forward into the wide hallway. A crossbow fired with a snap and a hiss. Its short bolt sped down the length of the hall and slammed into Bogard's chest near the right edge of his triple-thick brass breastplate. It penetrated plate and muscle to bury its not-very-sharp iron head in one of his massive ribs. Bogard grunted, accepted the hurt, and exploded into berserker motion. Berserker rage is much misunderstood— it is less anger than it is demonic fixity of purpose. Bogart struck high with his long axe. The guard blocked the stroke with his short sword. Steel shrieked and sparks flew. He struck low and again the guard parried. Then his almost instantaneous backstroke took off the guard's sword hand at the wrist. Sword and gripping hand bounced off the hallway's far wall. The man screamed in horror and fell. Bogard leapt over the sprawling, bleeding body and charged down the hall. The sands of a nearly empty minute glass measured the time he had to reach the crossbowman before that weapon was again ready to fire. He reached the hall's end with a few grains to spare. He flattened his back against the wall to the left of the murder hole and pulled his long knife from its sheath. He heard a scratching noise the scrape of brass vambraces against stone as the crossbowman brought his weapon to the ready. He leaned forward and drove his knife into the hole. It plunged into unseen cloth, leather, and flesh. A muffled cry of pain and dismay sounded through the murder hole, followed by the thump of a body hitting the floor. Trusting that the crossbowman was sufficiently discouraged, Bogard wiped his knife on his leggings, sheathed it, and crossed in front of the murder hall. The hall turned right. He continued following it. After a dozen or so paces, he came to another right turn. Beyond the turn was a landing and two steep stairways. One led up, and the other led down. Bogard stopped. The hallway was more than adequately lit by torches and wall sconces. The stairway on his left was also well lit and presumably ascended to the wizard's private quarters. The other stairway descended into darkness. Carl would likely be found downstairs. Bogard judged that even a wealthy wizard would be reluctant to pay more than three guards at a time. Any further defenses he might encounter would be of a magical nature. He nodded to himself and retraced his steps. He found the wounded guard seated on the floor near the open doorway, cradling his bleeding stump with his good arm and rocking back and forth in misery. Bogard knelt and gripped the man's injured arm. Blood pulsed from the wound. He wrapped a leather thong four times around the arm, pulled it taut, and knotted it. The bleeding stopped. He pulled the man to his feet. Come with me. It's not your day. Weeping quietly, the guard staggered ahead of Bogard. Bogard steadied him with his left hand. They reached the stairways. We'll go down. You go first. The man sniffled. Bogard prodded him with his axe handle. Go ahead. The man leaned against the wall with his good shoulder and stumbled unevenly down the stairs. Bogard waited. When the man's foot touched the seventh step, green mage light flared. The wounded guard disappeared. Bogard blinked, then he stepped forward. He knew that magical wards, once activated, must be recast. Hoping that he would encounter no more enchanted traps, he plunged down the shadowed stairway. 
It wound in corkscrew fashion through several turns to a wide door. The door was open. The room beyond it was lit by a single torch in a sconce high on the opposite wall. Beneath the torch hung Carl. Weary of flanking knives and swords, Bogart leapt through the doorway and whirled. No guards awaited him. He turned to Carl. The little man stood on tiptoe, his wrists pulled high and taut by iron chains. The chains were attached to massive staples just below the torch. Carl? Carl raised his head and grinned. His voice cracked when he answered, I hoped you would come. And a tifa told me where I might find you. <coughs> Took you long enough? Bogard shrugged and winced when the crossbow bolt reminded him of its presence. <sighs> Not as young as I once was. Carl's grin widened. The wizard wants to meet you. Tell me later. I sketch you down. Bogart gripped his long axe with both hands, measured the angle of his stroke, and swung. The axe bit through the soft iron chain and splashed stone sparks from the wall behind. Carl's left arm fell to his side. Bogart swung again. Carl slid to the floor. <coughs> Thanks, boss. Bogart nodded. Hornemorn will be down shortly. Can you move? Give me a hand up. Bogart shifted his axe to his left hand, bent down, gripped Carl's belt, and hauled him to his feet. Carl swayed, but remained standing. Up and out, Carl. I doubt we have much time. One of the guards tripped a warding spell. Uh, Carl staggered toward the stairs. Bogart followed him. They were safe up the stairs, safe down the hallway, safe around the turn, and safe past the still unconscious guard. Bogard saw Carl stumble out of the open front door and was within feet of the portal when a web of black silk enveloped him. He slashed at it with his axe, but his blade wouldn't bite into the silkiness. The web caressed, gripped, and finally squeezed. Bogard knew nothing more. Bogard swam in a dark sea. Shapes loomed. Shadows menaced him, but did not attack. He rose to a wavering light. The light was a torch. Beneath the torch stood Hanuman. Ah, awake again? Bogard said nothing. He tried to move and discovered, not surprisingly, that he was lying on his back on a table bound hand and foot. His arms were chained to iron staples near his thighs. His legs were tied painfully apart as if he were a dancer frozen in mid-leap. That may be uncomfortable, but you needn't stay bound for very long. Bogard turned his head. What happened to your god? Hanuman shrugged. Oh, nothing terrible. A spell transported him to a dungeon cell. When I have time, I'll release him and then fire him. I'm not a monster. I do think I shall dock him his last week's pay. He didn't discharge his duties very well, after all. What do you want with me? Hanuman smiled. You possess a magic talisman. He looked up at the ceiling and tapped his front teeth with an excessively long fingernail. It is unclear to me how you came to possess it, but it is powerful beyond your imagining. Nothing like it has ever before come into the world of men. Bogard sighed. The Brysinga? Hanuman nodded. The Brysinga. Freya's magical necklace. A goddess's greatest treasure. I want it. Of course, it will take decades of intense study before I actually dare to use it. Once mastered, though, its powers will make me supreme among wizards on Earth. It might. He stared into distances invisible above and beyond Bogart's head. Allow me to enter higher planes to undertake... Godly endeavors. He looked directly at Bogard. So, will you arrange for the Brysinger to be transported here? No. 
Will you escort me to your hall and present the necklace to me? No. Hanuman sighed. I thought as much. Therefore, I have prepared a little device to persuade you to cooperate with me. Bogart followed him with his eyes. Hanuman stopped and pointed to the distant ceiling. If you'll glance above, you'll note a large, razor-sharp scimitar blade suspended from a pendulum. Bogart said, I see it. Good. Can you guess what it's for? You plan to use it to convince me to give you the Brasinga. Hanuman clapped his hands together. Bravo! You are astute for an ignorant barbarian. Bogart grunted. Huh, thanks. Hanuman stroked his beardless chin. I read widely across the worlds, across the ages. Pa, uh, pa, uh, poo, po, po. He raised a slightly crooked index finger to his lips. Yes, Poe. It was Poe. This Poe fellow had a decent idea. I refined it, as you can see. He walked to the foot of the thick table on which Bogard was bound. You'll also note how your legs are elevated and splayed apart. Bogard nodded. Notice how the scimitar blade is aligned with the midline of your body. When I depress this lever, Hanuman pressed the lever forward, a concealed mechanism begins to function. Above Bogard, the blade-tipped pendulum began to swing. With each swing, the blade described a wider arc through the shadowed air. A rhythmic, low-pitched whoosh issued from the darkness above. Hanuman chuckled. The blade descends a tiny fraction of an inch with each swing. I haven't timed it precisely, but it shouldn't take longer than a few hours before it comes close to you. You can deduce from the position of your legs what part of your anatomy will be first in jeopardy. Bogart said nothing. Hanuman continued. The string close to your right hand is connected to a bell in my chamber. When you decide to give me the necklace, just pull it. I shall stop the mechanism as quickly as I may. Hanuman turned, paused, turned back, and looked at Bogard. You wouldn't want to save yourself all this anguish and agree to give it to me now? Bogard again said nothing. Ah, well, Hanuman shrugged. I leave you to contemplate the consequences of willfulness. He turned and ascended the stairs. Bogard looked up at the blade. Still distant, it gleamed evilly in the torchlight. The steady whoosh of its passage through the air was already his least favorite sound. The sound of mindless, inexorable malice. He glanced at the string next to his right hand. Iron cuffs circled his wrists. Short lengths of stout chain were welded to the cuffs and to the bolts in the table on which he lay. He could move his hands a few inches in either direction. He could easily grasp the string and pull it. His hand remained still. Bogart had fought unnumbered, desperate battles. He had faced defeat and death before. He knew the value of time. When you can win nothing else, win a bit of time. He closed his eyes, shut out at least the sight of the doomful blade. He prepared to wait for as long as he could. His thoughts drifted to his grandchildren, little Olga and bouncy Fafir. Fafir was only four and Olga six. He vowed silently to spend more time with them should he escape his present plight. He was wise enough to know that children learn little from instruction, but simply walking through a day with their grandfather would live in their minds always. He opened his eyes. The scimitar was much closer, only a few feet above his vulnerable groin. The fingers of his right hand twitched. Not yet. Not just yet. He closed his eyes again. He thought of his youngest daughter, Gudrun. She'd followed her husband south to Arlene, a country of rains, forest, and civilized habits. 
Ogard wanted very much to visit her. He secretly doubted, however, that he could survive even a day in Cultural Lane. He would not be allowed to bear his personal weapons. Walking unarmored among strangers was far worse than being naked in an ice storm. He opened his eyes. The great, dark blade now swung between his outstretched legs. It was within inches of slicing him open in the worst of ways. Bogart reached for the string and pulled. The blade continued its inexorable descent. Alarmed, Bogart pulled the string again and again. The blade did not slow. He glanced toward the stairway. Hanuman was there. The wizard steepled his fingers, pursed his lips, and looked at Bogard. My curiosity may overcome both my better judgment and my humanitarian impulses. I really would like to see how my little creation will work. Surely you can afford a little blood? Bogard glared at the mage with mingled despair and rage, but he did not answer. The blade whistled as it grazed the woolly hairs of Bogard's breeks. Hanuman smiled. Don't be silly. You've cost me my guards, spells, and a good deal of trouble. Just a little discomfort on your part will allow me to calibrate the device. A silver glow suddenly lit the stairway behind Hanuman. He didn't notice it. His attention was fixed upon the next stroke of the blade. The scimitar swooped down, cutting through Bogard's breeks, cutting deeper. Bogard lurched against the chains when he felt the sharp blade's icy sting as it sliced through the skin of his most intimate appendage. In horror beyond any he'd known, he watched the blade pause at the top of its backstroke. It paused, then swept back towards his helpless manhood. He closed his eyes and so missed the appearance of a giant silver hand. The hand flowed like mist around and over Hanuman to coalesce around the downswinging blade. The scimitar slowed. Cracks, groans, and grinding of gears sounded from above. The blade slowed further. Hanuman, fingers and thumbs spread wide, gestured with his right hand. A red bolt of energy burst from his palm and struck the silver hand. The red bolt bounced off the hand and dissolved into hundreds of yellow lightning darts. These darts zipped erratically around the dungeon. Hanuman gestured again, and a transparent shield appeared in front of him. The silver hand gave one final wrench, and the scimitar stopped inches from Bogard's defenseless groin. Hanuman yelped as the odd lightning dart avoided his shield and struck home. The silver hand again became silver mist and settled over Bogard. The chains holding him down dissolved. Stiffly, carefully, he raised his right leg over the still menacing blade and rolled to his left. He rolled until he was sitting on the table facing Hanuman. The last of the lightning darts sputtered against Hanuman's shield and fizzled away. Hanuman raised his right eyebrow twice. The shield disappeared. He slowly straightened and smiled. It looks as if we'll have to continue this experiment another time. I have urgent business elsewhere. He cast a black pellet onto the floor with his left hand. The pellet exploded into brown smoke. The smoke boiled up toward the distant ceiling. Orange light glowed at its center. So I'll say farewell. He stepped into the orange glow and began to fade. Bogart reacted with characteristic swiftness. He snatched his throwing knife, left in his boot sheath by Hanuman in his arrogance, and cast it into the center of the orange glow. He was rewarded with a distant howl of pain. Carl's head appeared around the edge of the doorway. You okay, boss? Bogart grinned. Just barely. Carl entered the dungeon. He held a long knife in his right hand and liquid starfire in his left. He raised the white fire toward Bogard. I brought this. Bogard sighed. The Bryce Singer. Its magic saved me. Carl smiled. Ilsa thought it might prove useful against a wizard. Guess she was right. She was right. How did you get in here? Carl shrugged. You know me. 
There wasn't any work at all to climb the wizard's wall and find a window to break. I went back to the hall first to get some weapons and tools. Turns out all I needed was this necklace. You're its guardian, and it feels the same about you. Bogart groaned. Let's get out of here. Sure, boss. Give me a hand. Your poor shoulder. Bogart shifted in his chair. Uh, it's nothing, girl. Ingrid dipped a clean cloth in the warm water, squeezed it almost dry, and wiped dried blood from Bogart's arm. Her thick, blonde braid swayed as she worked. She leaned against him, pressing her deep, soft bosom against his elbow. Get your teeth off, Bogart, this instant before he faints from pain. Ilsa rounded the corner in a swirl of furs and black shawl. Don't you know where he got caught? Ingrid gaped with surprise. Ilsa snarled, Up, silly girl, now! Ingrid shot to her feet as her cheeks flushed a delicate rose. Ilsa pointed toward the kitchen. Out! Ingrid flounced toward the passageway to the kitchen. She looked back over her shoulder and, when she was sure Ilsa wasn't looking, stuck out her tongue. Without turning her head, Ilsa snapped, I saw that! Five bags of potatoes, washed and peeled by mid-afternoon bell, or I'll cane your skinny shanks, you nasty girl. Ingrid squealed and ran for the kitchen. Now, Ilsa rubbed her hands together. Let's take care of this crossbow bolt. Lie down flat on the floor. Bogard stirred uneasily, but did as he was ordered with accompanying grunts and moans. <laughs> Shouldn't we leave it until Dr. Einar comes? Nonsense! I've forgotten more about wounds than that fakir will ever know. This is a minor hurt, unless we wait to treat it. So saying, she placed her left foot against his chest, gripped the bolt shaft with both hands, and pulled. What surely must have been the death howl of a pain-maddened wolf floated across ice-bound Nordheim. Old men checked the bars on their doors. Mothers held their babes close. Ilsa shouted, Stop your silly whining! It's out, and the bleeding was slow as soon as I pour on my secret wound potion. Bogart gasped, Not the wound potion! Oh, be quiet! This will keep the wound from festering. It only stings a bit at first. Again, the howl of the tormented wolf floated across ice-sheathed roofs shining softly in starlight. Nordheim's denizens glanced at each other nervously shivered, and hoped never to hear such a desperate sound again. Robert Walton is a retired middle school teacher, rock climber, and mountaineer with a sense in Yosemite and Pinnacle National Park. Walton is an experienced writer with five novels, both young adults and adult, to his credit. His Civil War novel, Don Drums, won the 2014 New Mexico Book Awards Tony Hillerman Prize for Best Fiction. Most recently, his Joaquin's Gold, a collection of Joaquin Murrieta's tales, was published on Amazon. His website is chaosgatebook.wordpress.com. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that story. So, originally I tried to do this with Dutch accents and realized I really cannot do a Dutch accent, or Icelandic, or any sort of Norwegian accent at all. Something for me to work on, I guess. But I hope you liked this story. It's been a while since I've had any sort of Viking or barbarian-themed story, I believe, so when I saw it, I just couldn't pass it up. Anyway, if you guys enjoyed this, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a comment if you're on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast version, just be sure to subscribe for more brand new short stories. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.